So welcome to lecture two, lexical and semantic change. So first we'll look at lexical change. So Campbell begins the chapter like he likes to with a quote. So here the quote is from the graphic novelist uh, Marjan Satrapi. All big changes of the world come from words. One reason why lexical change is the second lecture, so it comes quite early in the course, is that uh, changes in the lexicon are quite uh, salient, so easy for people even who aren't linguists to notice. Even in kind of daily conversation, you might find yourself uh, talking about where do words like bling or blog come from. Uh, one reason for this salience of new words uh, in, uh, in, let's say, ordinary life is uh, because informal language, so slang or casual language, tend to have a lot of new words in them. Uh, and many of those words don't survive from generation to generation. Uh, but as a consequence, uh, you know, everyone in the course of their life is exposed to uh, new words. So what are the different ways that uh, new words come into a language? So we're going to look at all these uh, different ways. Uh, which right now will just be a list of uh, of possibilities. So invented words, words from personal names, words from group names, words from place names, acronyms, compounds, neoclassical compounds as a specific kind of compound, blends, clipping, and onomatopoeia. So to start with invented words, it's quite rare um, process, but there are it's just uh, words that someone invents. So blurb was coined by the American humorist Gellet Burgess in 1907. Gas was coined by the Dutch chemist J.B. von Helmont in 1632. And paraffin was invented as a word by the German chemist Karl Reichenbach in 1830. So now we turn to words that come from personal names. The first example is cereal, like breakfast cereal. It comes from Latin cerealis, which uh, derives from Ceres, the name Ceres, who is the Roman goddess of agriculture. The word panic comes from the Greek god Pan. Mesmerize comes from the name of the Austrian physician Franz Anton Mesmer, 1734 to 1815 whose experiments induced trans-like states in his subjects. Saxophone is named after its Belgian inventor, Antoine, also called Adolphe Sax, who lived from 1814 to 1894. And nicotine is named after Jean Nico, who lived from 1530 to 1600, the French ambassador to Portugal, who first introduced tobacco into France. The word cannibal is first recorded by Christopher Columbus. It derives from an alternative version of the name of the feared Carib Indians who were called Caniba by the Taino on Hispaniola. Gothic originates from the Goths, a Germanic tribe. Vandal and Vandalize from the Vandals who are a different Germanic tribe. Now turning to place names, Bedlam, a scene of uproar or confusion, comes from the colloquial pronunciation of Bethlehem in St. Mary of Bethlehem, London's first psychiatric hospital. Bikini, a woman's two-pieced bathing suit, is named after Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands, uh, which is where the first hydrogen bomb was tested. Uh, and it was called that, it was named that as a branding exercise because of its explosive impact on fashion. Not very politically correct, frankly. And continuing with not so uh, politically correct names, we have Byzantine, meaning excessively complicated, named after the Byzantine Empire, which had a very um, complex royal court. Canary, the bird, canary in a coal mine, is named after the Canary Islands. Continuing with place names, Jeans, referring to popular trousers, derives from the city of Genoa in Italy, where a similar fabric was originally produced. 
Denim, the sturdy fabric from which jeans are made, comes from the French phrase Serge de Nîmes. So Serge, a kind of fabric, from Nîmes. Uh, and uh, Nîmes is a city in France uh, that was known for its textile production. So the de in denim is, from, is, is the French de, meaning uh, from. And then a current, the small version of a raisin, uh, takes its name from the city of Corinth in Greece, which was uh, once a major exporter of these uh, fruits. Spa, a place of relaxation and water-based treatments, originates from the town of Spa in Belgium, which uh, was a resort town uh, known for its mineral springs. Now turning to acronyms, these are words that are formed from taking the initial letter or syllable of several uh, words in a phrase. So for example, people say ASAP, get it to me ASAP, I don't say that personally, uh, which comes from as soon as possible. And then NASA is the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Uh, people say LOL, but they also say LOL, or laughing out loud. And then uh, scuba originally is a phrase, self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. And radar, radio detection and ranging. So now we move on to compounding. Just to reiterate, what we're looking at is processes by which you form new words. So the, the compound word doesn't necessarily have to have an obviously related meaning. The, the idea is that uh, the process of compounding allows us to take existing lexical material and make new words out of it. So, for instance, an all-nighter. An all-nighter is uh, when you stay up all night, uh, usually to study for exams. So uh, I recommend against uh, doing that. Uh, and then a couch potato is a lazy person who lies around, particularly watching television. Cyberbullying is online harassment, so uh, bullying of a cyber variety. And then red eye has two meanings, both cheap whiskey and uh, a late night or very early morning flight. Now, because of sound change, compounds can become untransparent through time. So here are a few examples. Gospel was originally a compound of uh, the words that became good and spell, meaning good news. Elbow is originally a compound uh, of the word L, which just barely survives in English as a unit of measurement equal to the length of a forearm. So it meant forearm originally, and we still have it in the phrase, give him an inch and he'll take an L. Although uh, many speakers have remodeled that phrase uh, replacing L with mile, which is a more salient uh, unit of measure. Uh, and then bow is is bow, like in, uh, you know, like bow and arrow bow. So it means bend in the forearm. So uh, a bow of the L, yeah. It's more obvious in German Ellenbogen that it's still a, a compound. Gossip, this is a fun one, I think, originally meant god parent. So the ga is the god part, uh, and then the sib is um, is like in sibling. Uh, and then it evolves first to mean a close friend or confidant, and then uh, eventually, by way of being the kind of conversation you have with such a person, it's the act of sharing personal or intimate news or, you know, just gossiping. Yeah, we all know what gossiping means. One of the ways, particularly in English, we like to make compounds is with little bits of Greek and Latin that we have floating around. These uh, bits of Greek and Latin have come free of the uh, Greek and Latin words that they originally uh, came with into English. So we have auto in things like auto suggestion. We have mega in mega church or mega project, micro, microchip, microsurgery, mini in minivan, pan, pandemic pan-global, pseudo in pseudo-friend, pseudo-scientific, trans, transgender, or transnationals. These uh, neoclassical compounds, so compounds formed of uh, bits of Greek and Latin, is quite a popular way to make new words in English.
Now on to amalgamation. So amalgamation, just to distinguish these things, is when you have a whole phrase that becomes one word. So it's not quite the same as compounding. Compounding is where you take two words to make a new word. Uh, and amalgamation is basically where a phrase is reinterpreted as a single word. So almost is from all plus most, alone from all and then one, uh, all together from all together, always from all ways, however from however and without from uh, without. Uh, although I will point out that with originally meant something like against. So now looking outside of English for examples of amalgamation, we have usted, which comes from vuestra merced, your mercy, your grace. Tambien also, which comes from tan bene, as well. Todavía, still or yet, comes from totavía, meaning always. Hidalgo, member of the lower nobility, comes from hijo de algo, literally, son of something, maybe um, comparable in English to a man of means. Uh, and then for a French example, the word for today, aujourd'hui, it comes from O, to the, or at the, and then jour, day, and then dui, jour, dui, uh, day of today. So actually what's going on there is the Latin hodier, which gives us just the we, uh, because of regular sound chains, became so short that they kept adding more to it. Jour, dui, aujourd'hui. So next are blends. This is where rather than putting two words next to each other, like you do in compounding or in another way in amalgamation, the process of coining the new word is to take bits from both of those words. So smog, we have the sm from smoke and the og from fog. Brunch, the br from breakfast and the unch from lunch. Bit comes from binary digit. Brexit is a blend of British and exit. I will point out, however, that more precisely speaking, Brexit is an analogy to uh, Grexit. So Greece is to Grexit as Britain is to X. X equals Brexit. Because Britain left the EU and Greece didn't, uh, Brexit is now more salient than Grexit. But of course, uh, Grexit got there first. And the influence of Grexit, we can still ascertain because uh, British and exit are not two words you would be tempted to smash together, at least phonologically, whereas uh, in many European languages, the vowel in Greece and in exit are uh, the same. So like in French, we have grec and exit. So saying brexit is a very sensible thing to do in French. And in fact, uh, that uh, blending of grec and exit uh, is what happened in French. And then that was borrowed into English, and then through analogy uh, was created Brexit. That's just to give a more detailed etymology of Brexit. Moving on, telethon is television plus marathon, workaholic, work plus alcoholic, sexting, sex plus texting. You get the idea. Okay, now clipping, that's when you just take a long word and chop a bit off of it. Now, in the first instance, usually there's not a semantic change, but as we'll see, a semantic change can happen. Ad comes from advertisement. App comes from application. And uh, in this case, it's, it's clear that uh, application, we still have like a college application, uh, but we don't say college app. An app is particularly a computer application, a web application, or a phone application, a phone app, yeah? Uh, so that shows that, that first comes the clipping, then comes semantic specialization. So bike is from bicycle. Bus is from omnibus. A very strange uh, word because bus is actually just uh, a dative plural ending in Latin. So omnibus means for everyone. And then perk, uh, like the perk of the job, comes from perquisite, which is not a, a word you hear very much anymore, but uh, it means the same thing as perk. Now, rounding off this section, onomatopoeia is the phenomenon of creating 
new words that mimic sounds in nature. So for instance, buzz is the sound of bees, chirp, the sound of birds, meow, uh, the sound of cats, and whiz, the sound of uh, swift moving air. Now, I would just like to point out that these things are language specific, right? Roosters, cows, they say different things in different languages. Uh, but uh, it's still the case that uh, in a given language, the, the, the word is invented in order to sound like something real in the world. And that is one way to create new words. So, so far, we've been looking at how you get new words, uh, but it's worth mentioning that we also can lose words. So I move on to obsolescence and loss of vocabulary. In a sense, to the extent that there's a continuous written tradition in a language, old words that have uh, you know stopped being used can be revived. Actually, a, a great example of this is the word weird in English. It's a direct ancestor in Old English meant fate, and then Shakespeare used it when it was very obsolescent uh, and people had forgotten what it meant. He used it in the phrase weird sisters in uh, the play Macbeth, uh, and then it was understood by people to mean uh, strange sisters. So then it came back into the language, uh, meaning strange or, or odd. So to go through these examples, adorable is a dull-witted pedant, a ducibel, a term of endearment for a sweetheart, a fribbler, one who feigns love but dreads commitment, or more generally, someone who's frivolous, and a jarkman is a vagabond counterfeiter. So next, I'm going to discuss suppletion. Suppletion is not a category of um, loss of words per se, but it is, uh, generally speaking, historically evidence for the loss of words. Uh, suppletion is when a single paradigm, if you like, a, a set of uh, semantically related words that uh, form a system has etymologically unrelated uh, material in it. So, for instance, English, good, better, best. Better and best seem like they have something to do with each other, but good is clearly a different uh, item. Other examples from English, go and went, are two different uh, verb stems. Went is originally the past tense of the verb wend, but now synchronically it's the past tense of go. And then verbs to be are often irregular in many languages. In English, we have four different verb stems, the one seen in am, the one seen in is, the one seen in was, and the one seen in been, and these all actually go back to different Indo-European roots. Now looking at Finnish, uh, we we have good, better, best again with different materials. So here, uh, hiva, I don't know Finnish, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, parempi and paras, and then in Spanish, also a verb to go, ir and fue, the infinitive and the past, come again from different stems. So something has been lost. Uh, in these cases, uh, in order for two uh, unrelated words to become part of the same paradigm. So that was it for lexical change, and now we're going to move on to semantic change, although we have touched on it a little bit. And like the section on lexical change, in, in essence, I, I'm just going to take you through uh, a few different labels for different types of semantic change. So first we have widening or generalization. This is when a word with a specific meaning comes to have a wider meaning. The word bird in modern English means uh, any kind of bird, uh, but in old English it meant specifically a young bird. Uh, and then salary, which means any form of compensation you get for work, comes from uh, a Latin term salarium, uh, which is specifically the allotment of salt given to a soldier. So it's a kind of compensation, uh, but a very specific kind and for a very specific category of employment. So it's widened to come to mean English salary. Now the opposite of widening is narrowing or specialization. Deer in Old English meant any kind of animal. It's cognate with German tier, which still means any kind of animal. And girl in Middle English meant child or young person of either sex, whereas now it means a specifically female child. Next we get to pejoration. This is when a word comes to have negative connotations. So knave originally meant a boy or a servant, compared German knabe. Uh, but uh, to the extent it's used at all now, uh, it means uh, a scoundrel. Yeah, quite common in Shakespeare plays with that meaning. So next, silly. 
uh, originally meant holy. It's cognitive the German selig. And just to explain the steps there, first it meant holy, then it meant eccentric in a way that's characteristic of a holy person. Uh, and then it meant eccentric. And then it meant ridiculous. And then the third example, villain, comes from villain, which meant serf. And villain came from villanus, agricultural slave, uh, which is, uh, etymologically speaking, a thing that belongs to a villa. So it comes from villa. Now, Campbell gives this as an example of pejoration, but I think that he is slightly missing the specific semantics of agricultural slave and serf in, in the sense of unfree person on a manor. So it's been a pejorative, it, let's say it's been a negative term the whole time, uh, but the negativeness uh, had a specific uh, legal social meaning, and now it doesn't. A villain is just, a, you know, especially like a superhero has a villain. Yeah, super villains. Uh, now, the opposite of pejoration is amelioration. So nice uh, originally meant stupid or foolish. Uh, and the stages in the semantic change are stupid and foolish goes to uh, obsessive. Uh, and then obsessive becomes uh, meticulous, specifically uh, with respect to appearance. And then, you know, someone of meticulous appearance looks nice. And then dude originally meant a dandy. Uh, so, you know, maybe some people are fond of dandies, but in general, to call someone a dandy is rude. Uh, whereas uh, now, dude, hey dude, doesn't have any negative semantics. So next, taboo replacement or euphemism. Sometimes words start to have a connotation or meaning that is not polite to talk about. Toilet, has come to be replaced by euphemisms like bathroom, restroom, or lavatory. I was once uh, in the city of Bath, and a very posh woman asked the waitress where the cloakroom was, and then the waitress offered to take her coat, uh, and then the woman was quite disoriented because, you know, she was potentially being forced to say the word toilet. And then the animal names, ass and cock, in the U.S. are typically called donkey or rooster. In both cases, for different reasons, the word for the animal has come to be associated with part of the human body that it's uh, not considered polite to talk about. Another way that um, words can change their meaning is through metaphor. Bead, for instance, originally meant prayer. Old English gebeta, cognate with German gebeta, which still means prayer. The reason why a word meaning prayer comes to mean bead, is because on a rosary, you count your prayers one at a time, each one with a bead. The object used to count prayers uh, takes on the name of the prayer. Mouse, the animal, has metaphorically been applied to a computer mouse. Thrill went from to pierce to meaning to pierce with emotion uh, to meaning to fill with pleasure. So in the first place, to, to pierce is something quite concrete. Uh, and then metaphorically, that comes to mean fill with pleasure. So those are metaphors. Slang is full of metaphors. So for instance, instead of saying to kill, you can say blow away, bump off, eliminate. For drunk, you can say bashed, blitzed, bombed, sauced, wasted, etc. Moving on to metonymy, metonymy involves a change in meaning where a word gains additional senses related to its original meaning, often through continuity in the real world, so physical continuity. For example, cheek means this part of the face, right? Uh, and it comes from an old English word that means jawbone. Similarly, the Spanish word for cheek also comes from a Latin uh, word for jawbone. So those are, are real examples of um, metonymy. Campbell gives other examples that are less obviously metonymy to me. So tea uh, in the north of England, meaning e evening meal. Uh, elope originally uh, applied to a married woman who ran off with a lover. 
uh, but now means to to get married without much to do beforehand. Uh, and then French jument mare originally meant a pack horse. So as I've said, it's not so clear to me that, um, you know, the classic example of metonymy is to say something like uh, the White House when you mean uh, the U.S. government. Uh, and it's not totally clear to me how some of these uh, are cases like that. And now synecdoche uh, involves using a part to refer to a whole or vice versa. So mail originally meant a bag or pouch, but shifted to mean letters carried in a bag. Paper extended uh, to refer to a newspaper or an article uh, in, in a journal or book, like, uh, you know, have you written your paper yet? Spanish boda, wedding, comes from vota, marriage vows. This one, I think, is really synecdoche, right? Because a, a marriage vow is part of a wedding. Um, and I suppose paper is part of a newspaper, but still. Uh, German bein, leg, originally meant bone. Yeah, and a bone is part of a leg, I guess. English schmuck comes from originally a, a word meaning jewel, and then jewel came to mean penis in Yiddish, and then in both Yiddish and uh, English, it comes to mean a contemptible person. So I don't think this is really uh, a synecdoche, and that's why I say I don't think most of uh, Campbell's examples are actually synecdoche, uh, but at least this Boda example, is a, it's clear that a part is standing in for a whole. Next, we have displacement or ellipsis. In these cases, a phrase has one of its words drop out, basically. So capital from capital city. So we say the capital of Ireland is Dublin. And then we've created a new meaning because capital there doesn't mean important. It means seat of government. Contacts from contact lenses. Intercourse from sexual intercourse. Proposal from marriage proposal. Salad from erba salata in Latin, so salted vegetables. So salad actually just comes from salted. Success comes from French succès favorable, so a favorable outcome, where success just means a, a thing that's happened uh, etymologically. And then foie, meaning liver in French, and uh, also words for liver in other Romance languages, comes from Latin iecur ficatum, a liver stuffed with figs. So the foie word actually comes from uh, a word for figs. Now, next we have litotes, which is exaggeration by understatement. So you say of no small importance, meaning very important. So battle originally meant to beat or strike. And now it means something much larger than that. Uh, bereaved originally meant robbed. That's also clearly a, a kind of euphemism. Kill originally meant hit or strike. And then venom comes from Latin venenum, meaning poison or medicine, uh, but prehistorically comes from love potion and is cognate with Venus. So I've talked through um, a whole variety of terms for different kinds of lexical change and semantic change, and that's all for today.